Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Myung Jin and San. Peter Coyote uh, is, is a Zen practitioner. He was uh, at San Francisco Zen Center for a while and also the narrator of umpteen uh, Ken Burns films. And he just put out a book called Vernacular Zen, which I have to get because that is so much what I strive for uh, in my Zen practice is to use <clears throat> words that are appropriate for the situation. Um, a lot of times we can fall into uh, really kind of zenny habits where, you know, somebody asked me, what is Buddha? What is Buddha? Dried shit on a stick. Ask me again. What is Buddha? Cypress tree in the courtyard. Both of those, I would give the big ah, because I am not in a latrine anywhere. I don't use a stick and I don't have a cypress tree, much less a courtyard. The appropriate answer for me right now would be if I wanted to go the garden route, I could say piles of wet mulch is Buddha, or I could say a 24 inch monitor in front of me is Buddha. But all these other things are just you know, little Zen phrases we like to throw around to show how Zenny we are a lot of times. Um, another couple are, are um, go drink tea, sort of a dismissive, passive aggressive thing to say, you know, if you really think about it. But so far as I'm aware, the only person that would be appropriate for me to say that to right now would be Kevin, because he mentioned that someone just brought him a cup of tea. And since he has the purple waves in the back, ah, there you go. Okay, so ding, ding, ding. Uh, appropriate. Another one is go wash your bowls. I didn't just eat breakfast. I generally don't eat breakfast anyway. So telling me to go wash my bowls would be just inappropriate. You could say, uh, I don't know, take out the garbage, you know, uh, something along those lines, and it might work better. Zen is directly pointing to the mind, seeing your true nature and becoming a Buddha. Uh, and the rest of what Bodhidharma said was, <clears throat> do not establish words and letters. And that's right except words and letters are all we have. You know, we can <clears throat> talk about fingers pointing to the moon and all that, which is another one that, you know, like unless you are literally pointing at the moon and there's a moon at which you can point again, I'm going to look askance on it. Yes, Kevin, you you have a moon to point to there. Okay, you're you're betting a thousand tonight, buddy. <clears throat> so um, let me give you a couple of um, quotes here 
some words that I have actually, well, I didn't write them down myself, but I had, you know, copy and paste going. So, whoever knows that their constructs are fiction and devoid of anything real knows that his own mind neither exists nor does not exist. Worldly beings keep creating constructs claiming they exist while self-enlightened beings keep negating constructs claiming they do not exist. So basically you've got the two sides of a coin there where you either think everything is real or you go the other direction and you cling to emptiness. Oh, none of it exists. Or more like uh, everything exists as one. You know, the full picture is not two, not one, and you can't leave either of them out. If someone says to you, not two, you'd better come back immediately with not one, because that's how it works. Bodhisattvas and Buddhas neither create nor negate conceptualization. This is what is meant by the mind that neither, neither exists nor does not exist. The mind that neither exists nor does not exist is called the middle way. We try and stick to the middle, right? Not to go off into a ditch on this side of the road or on that side of the road, because we've seen that either extreme is only going to get you in trouble. Zen Master Sung San went along this uh, road also as, as to how he approaches uh, or suggests we should approach our practice. If you sincerely ask, what am I? Sooner or later, you will run into a wall where all thinking is cut off. We call this don't know. Zen is keeping this don't know mind always and everywhere. At all times, in all places, without interruption, what is this? One mind is infinite kalpas. But more importantly, rather than the procedure, let's talk about the product rather than the procedure or the process. What is this? What is it we're looking to do? What is our purpose in our practice? Cut off the conceptual thinking. I'd like to add, cut off the cliched thinking. Because the cliches are just concepts that we don't even know the definitions of anymore. Name of the Sangha is One Mind Zen Collective, which comes from uh, Huang Bo. And uh, his big statement that we have right on the front page of the website is, all the Buddhas and sentient beings are nothing but with one mind, beside which nothing exists. It's what you see before you. Begin to reason about it and at once you fall into error. The one mind alone is Buddha. What is this one mind? It's the paper in front of me. It's the monitor in front of me. It's the teacup in Kevin's hand. It's the swirly... <laughs> 
swirly purple background. It's the mirror on Robert's wall. It's the camera off for Hangdahl. It's a stick. Sans excrement, I might add. Words are all we've got. We can say, yeah, maybe example is good. You could say that. I wouldn't quibble with that any. It's probably uh, better than just talking about it. I mean, if you're hungry, you eat something, you're going to be better off than you're hungry and you eat a menu, right? Matsu said, mind is Buddha. Huang Bo said, everything is mind. So you should be seeing a connection here that whatever it is right in front of you is Buddha. And we take refuge in the Buddha. We take refuge in the universe. We don't exclude anything. We don't attach to anything. We don't negate it or treat it as if it were uh, permanent or had some sort of self nature, right? We're in it right now, right here. Who have you helped today? Have you done anything for anybody else? Are you basically all talk and no walk? Are you lazy in your practice? Where you'll take a snippet of what Bodhidharma said and say, ah, good, I don't have to read any sutras then. Or do you pick and choose the teachings that you like, which we all do, but to the point where you not only neglect, but disdain, don't even want to know about the other teachings. I mean, the Buddha was teaching for 45 years he didn't just have a PowerPoint with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and like take that around to various and sundry uh, poly conference rooms throughout the Gangetic Plain and that's it. He had 45 freaking years of teachings. How can we neglect them? Where do we get them from? They come from the sutras. They come from our teachers. They come from listening to um, Dharma talks, talking to other members of the Sangha, directly experiencing life right here, right now. If you can directly experience right here, right now, without any hindrance whatsoever, fair play to you. That has never been the case with me. I very easily fall into worldly mind. Certainly came from a place of worldly mind where you know, everything had a self nature. Everything was the end of the world if it went wrong. Everything was perfect, la di da, flowers, uh, if it went right. And then I got upset when it didn't go right. And, you know, I'd say, oh, the sun will come out tomorrow. And the next thing you know, there's a drought and it's 115 degrees. 
at midnight in Albuquerque. Or the sun will come out tomorrow because it's raining today. And the next thing you know, there's a hurricane and New York has disappeared under the oncoming flow of water and the subways are, you know, under six feet of water or whatever. Words are all we got. Let's use them wisely. Let's not attach to some and not bother you in listening to pay attention to thinking that maybe there's something to them and those other words, especially if it's the wo words of the Buddha, words of the sages and patriarchs and teachers and everybody else who has gone before us and has probably been well versed in all of these things and have attempted to make some sort of effort to try and get the point across. You can neglect it if you like, at your own peril. Neglect is a hindrance. Do you want hindrances? If you want hindrances, all yours. It's not something that we can take lightly as practitioners. We practice Zen to practice Zen. Zen practice is pointing directly to the mind, seeing our true nature. When we do that, we can say, Mo, we're enlightened if you like, or awakened, or you can say, eh, just another word, how may I help you? So in closing, if you come up to me and say something like, kill the Buddha, without any of the context around it, or go drink tea, or go wash your bowls. I'll hit you 30 times. Oh, no, wait, I probably wouldn't actually hit you 30 times because that's just another cliche. And I would probably just roll my eyes, mutter softly under my breath, and sigh because I do that a lot. <laughs>